Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Scott Chem webinar, one of a series of online events being run by Energy Technology Partnership Scotland and Research Innovation Scotland in the lead up to COP26. And I would like to thank ETP and RIS for organising the series. Scott Chem is the research pool for chemistry in Scotland, the strategic alliance between Scotland's world leading university chemistry schools. We coordinate and promote research, collaboration, translation, and skills delivery for chemistry in Scotland's universities. By doing this, we ensure chemistry research and innovation underpins economic growth in Scotland. As Scott Chem, we know that it is vital to contribute to the global commitment to achieving net zero. And with the Scottish Government's ambitious pledge to reduce carbon dioxide emissions by 75% by 2030 and to reach net zero by 2045, it is more important than ever to come together in a concerted effort to win solutions to some of our national and global challenges. As chemists, it's easy for us to see direct links between our work and achieving net zero because chemistry is fundamental across so many key areas. From the obvious ones like energy, natural products, drug discovery and recyclable materials to sectors where the impact of chemistry is not always recognised, such as biotechnology, sustainable manufacturing, environmental science, agriculture and food and drink sectors. The 2021 Scottish Enterprise data tells us that Scotland has 250 chemistry-based companies supporting 11,000 direct jobs and a further 70,000 jobs directly dependent on the sector. The chemical sciences generate 4.4 billion in exports per annum and from a revenue stream worth 9.3 billion, that is the second highest gross value add per employee of any industry in Scotland, contributing 1.4 billion GBA. In fact, 25% of Scottish manufacturing by turnover is based in the chemical sciences. Our chemical science-based companies benefit not only from our talented workforce and extra infrastructure, but also from our world-class R&D capabilities, with the chemical science sectors accounting for 50% of all industrial R&D in Scotland. This activity is based on a long and successful history of chemistry research, development and collaboration with industry and education, with Scotland ranked third in the world for chemistry, R&D, and 179 million invested in R&D each year. And our Scott Chem chemistry schools perform particularly well with three in the UK's top 10 and all are in the top 20 out of the 53 chemistry schools in the UK. We have more than 200 researchers and 60, 650 PhD students and last year they attracted more than 50 million in research grants. Scotland also has a proud history of investment into education. Our school system that values a broad arts science education Together with a strong college and university sector means that we can equip our young people with technical and research skills will be needed for the jobs of the future. Scotland's highly rated universities produce around 1,000 chemical science graduates per annum, building a strong and growing research talent base. Recent investment into securing R&D talent, and building R&D infrastructure means that we have a sound base upon which to grow our R&D capability. This includes the EDIS campus with capabilities in energy storage, battery components, synthetic fuels, material characterization, fuel cell testing, hydrogen production and storage, and carbon capture. The National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland has particular capabilities in lightweight manufacturing, carbon fibre, sustainable materials, factory visualisation, and bespoke training through its Skills Academy, while the Falkirk campus will have capabilities in carbon capture utilisation and biotechnology. And we have a joined up research sector. Our research pools, innovation centres and interface come together as Research Innovation Scotland so that we can capitalise on our combined scale and talents for the benefit of the country. This is very much part of a just transition. It's a lofty but critical aim, creating a more cohesive and resilient economy, improving opportunities, life chances and the well-being of everyone across the country. This will take a concerted and cohesive approach, strengthening existing collaborations and developing new partnerships to answer challenges in the race to net zero. Hosting COP26 in Glasgow in October gives us all an opportunity to showcase the amazing research, innovation, translation and skills development that is happening across our universities and college sectors, working in partnership with industry and government. It also gives us an opportunity to have the broader discussions with everyone in society. We must also ensure that youth has a voice in our decisions and actions because it is this generation that will be impacted in the future by our choices now. 
Scott Kim's participation in this series was a no-brainer because chemistry is a fundamental component in achieving net zero. We have an active role and a responsibility to help all citizens understand and achieve a just transition to net zero. We wanted to showcase some of the exceptional research talent and net zero innovations initiatives we have here in Scotland. Brilliant chemistry researchers doing excellent research, innovative educators working with industry to ensure that we have the right skills for the future jobs. And we are successfully working across the boundaries of disciplines, geographical borders and sectors to help us win the race to net zero. I'm delighted that you've joined us today to hear from an outstanding selection of some of our thought leaders in chemistry research, innovation, translation, education and engagement. We'll also be presenting some short videos showcasing just a few of the many examples of the exciting net zero research, translation and skills initiatives here in Scotland. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the video interviewees. I always find it's the most successful and busy people that somehow find the time to contribute more broadly to their sectors. And that can certainly be said of our speakers today. They will be guided by an amazing communicator, Penny Latin. Penny is a broadcaster, presenter, documentary maker and blogger with more than 25 years experience in programming with the BBC and in broad engagement across society. We're delighted to have such an experienced chair and I will, I will now hand over to Penny to introduce our panel. Thank you, Bill. Um, it's interesting when I was first asked to, to chair this event, which uh, is called Chemistry Achieving Net Zero Through Discovery, Innovation, Translation, and skills, two things went through my head. The first was, I'm not a chemist. How on earth am I gonna to manage to talk to a bunch of chemists about anything? Uh, mention the word chemistry, and my mind still immediately pictures Bunsen burners and periodic tables. And that's after years of making science documentaries and programs for the BBC. So I think like many of us, I'm stuck in a bit of a rut when it comes to the word chemistry and understanding its real world applications. My second thought was net zero. I don't know anything about net zero. How on earth am I going to begin talking about net zero? And I guess net zero is one of those expressions we've all heard of. Most of us have a vague notion of what it means in theory, the achievement of a point where we're no longer contributing to climate change, we're offsetting as much carbon as we're producing. But in terms of what that actually looks like, feels like in practice what a net zero world would involve is I suspect for many of us a bit less clear. What does it mean for how we heat our home, get from A to B, my partners in the construction business, what does it mean for that industry for example? Will it change the food we eat, the day-to-day -day choices we make, the jobs we do, what will it mean for our kids? When I try to answer those questions, if I'm honest the whole subject feels big and very unwieldy, um, certainly too much for me alone to handle. I don't quite know where to begin. I, I find it personally quite scary. And if it feels like that for me, then I suspect for many of you watching or listening to this, you may well feel the same, even if you're policymakers and academics. Net zero is a massive challenge. The problem is, if we don't rise to meet that challenge, it will impact on every single one of us. So while the demands of meeting net zero by 2045 will undoubtedly mean change, and that change may feel difficult and scary and expensive, I suspect the alternative of not doing anything will be scarier still. So while the thought of talking to a group of chemists about net zero fills me with a, a measure of fear, I do think that if Scotland's chemistry sector has some of the answers and innovation that we need, then I really want to hear about it. So the aim, of this particular event is that we should hopefully leave feeling a bit less scared and a lot more inspired, energised and informed, not just about what Scotland's chemistry sector has to offer, but also about what we as individuals can offer to help change happen. So with that in mind, let me introduce the panel who are going to help inspire, engage and energise us. Panel, as I introduce each of you, I'd like you just to explain what it is that you do and where you sit in the whole chemistry versus net zero equation. Plus maybe give me your top line and what you think the key challenge in your area um, of achieving net zero is. We will just keep it to the top line because we've got lots of 
lots of time ahead of us uh, to work our way through some of the challenges in more detail. Um, Jennifer Tempany, let me introduce you first of all. Deanna, Jennifer's Director of Strategic Partnerships and Business Development at Fourth Valley College. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Penny. Um, so a little bit a little bit of an introduction, where do I sit? Um, my background is in further in higher education. I work for Fourth Valley College, which is probably the leading further education college for science, uh, technology, engineering and maths. Um, currently, I'm also the co-founder of Fuel Change, which is an organisation that we set up to engage, empower and educate the next generation with regards to um, actions that they can take positively for climate change. Um, so I suppose lastly, my, my background in this is I'm not a chemist, I'm not a pure chemist, but I am a chemical engineer uh, to trade. And, and I think that has helped me throughout my career, actually. So I'm not doing any practice in chemistry or chemical engineering at the moment. Um, although somebody did ask me uh, to explain the formation of plastics this morning. So do you know what? It never leaves you. Never leaves you. Um, what's my biggest concern? My biggest concern is not actually, I've got two. One is what do we do in the short term and what do we do in the medium term? I think the shorter term will be hard and, and difficult um, with regards to actions that we're going to need to take. But I think the medium to longer term is going to require significant behavioural change and adaptation for all of us and how do we do that now so then it actually has the impact that we need it to have in 10 years time that's a very difficult thing to change our behaviors now for the future so that's my my concern or top line thank you penny thank you jennifer um caroline let me bring you in caroline strain is head of place for grangemouth investment zone at scottish enterprise caroline welcome Hello, thank you very much. Um, yes, my my take on all of this is being a non-chemist. Um, um, I have, have worked within Scottish Enterprise for many a year. Um, several people probably on the call have come across in previous roles within Scottish Enterprise, having prior to the role I'm doing just now, been head of chemical sciences and industrial biotechnology. Um, so have a uh, a working knowledge of the, the the industry in Scotland globally and how it interacts um, with particularly the academic side of things and the excellence therein. Um, my take on all of this with regard to the Falkirk Grangemouth Investment Zone is how do we make this happen in practice? So it's all about the practical application and the commercialisation to enable business to transition and to be able to, to enable Scotland to make this just transition that it needs to make. So it's a huge challenge, but without the ability to do the testing, the demonstrating, the bringing in the skills, having access to facilities for people to invest, etc., we're not going to be able to make that transition. Thanks, Caroline. Um, Mark, let me bring you in. Dr. Mark Bustard is Chief Executive Officer of the Industrial Biotechnology Innovation Centre. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Penny. Thanks uh, for the introduction, and it's great to join this afternoon. Um, I mean, for us, we're about driving the growth of the bioeconomy for Scotland. So it's looking at more sustainable manufacturing, sustainable supply chains, and new opportunities so that we can move away from complete reliance on the petrochemical industry, um, you know, in the short term. And obviously, where we'd like to get to is. Um, you know, a, a manufacturing industry that makes our chemicals, our materials, our medicines, which is sustainable. Um, it has a great impact in terms of the net zero carbon emissions. We know that using bio-based processes or green chemistry processes, you know, has significant impact on our emissions. Um, I guess for me, um, the challenge is we've got some fantastic traction at the moment, um, great innovation, great translation, but where our ambition lies is the successful translation of innovation into manufacturing. You know, can we get to scale? Um, and I, I started out as a biochemist. So to me, you know, biochemistry is just really complex chemistry, you know. So um, as part of this conversation, I look forward to bringing my experience working both in the, in the chemicals and biotechnology sector to bear. Um, but for me, it's about how do we really achieve this at scale? Because we do have an appetite, and Scotland particularly has an appetite to do this. 
Um, well, and we're delighted to be helping deliver um, some of those ambitions. So thank you, Penny. Thanks, Mark. I think scale is going to be something we're absolutely going to be returning to um, in the course of the next hour and a half. Ian, let me bring you in. Ian Hill is Strategic Lead for Innovation at the University of St Andrews. Welcome, Ian. Thanks very much, Penny. Um, I, I felt like a real interloper being a non-chemist. So I'm terribly glad that you and Jennifer and, and Caroline have all pointed out that you're not chemists either. Um, and maybe that's a useful thing. So I'm particularly involved with the University of St. Andrews Eden campus development, which is a kind of test and demonstration site. And so I suppose my qualifications for being here are that I know some really nice chemists and, and they're very bright people. And I think Part of what I'm involved in is helping that translation process, helping our academics to find a location where they can work with companies, where they can work on some of those work on some of those scale up issues that, that others have spoken about. In terms of challenges, um, I think I think Mark hinted at something there, which is about uh, net zero isn't only about energy; it, it, it's it's about the whole materials resource efficiency space and I think starting to think bigger is, is a really important uh, component but also I'm concerned that it's not a, just a technological fix and I think taking the people with us and supporting the societal challenges is going to be a really big issue for us in the future. Thanks Ian and very much uh, last but by no means least uh, Professor John Liggett, Professor of Polymer Science and Technology at the University of Strathclyde. Welcome uh, John. Yeah, thanks very much, Penny. And I hope you can see that behind me, I've established my credentials as a chemist by having two copies of the periodic table with me today. Um, yeah, I, I really want to echo something that Ian just said there. I think he's led in very nicely to me because I'm a material scientist. Uh, and so my contribution to this is really from the perspective of the materials resources. Um, currently, uh, with colleagues from Chemical and Process Engineering at Starclyde, um, part of a programme funded by the Natural Environment Research Council looking at smart, sustainable plastic packaging, um, the materials elements of that. But my interests in, in uh, packaging, sustainability and, and really the net zero agenda goes back 30 years. I, I work for ICI on their uh, flagship biodegradable polymer Biopol. It was a technical success at the time. 30 years ago, it got a lot of publicity. Um, there was headlines in the newspapers along the lines of fantastic plastic to save the world. There's a Biopol shampoo bottle in the collection of, of the British Museum. But 30 years on, probably the bulk of the people attending today have probably never heard of Biopol. And I think there's a really important message there. Um, there's more to the sustainability and net zero agenda than just solving technical problems. And, and this is something, again, uh, I, I want to echo what Jennifer said about this societal challenges here. And it's important to note that this wider NERC uh, programme, it, it's not just chemists, it brings together biologists, yes, but also social and business scientists, industry and uh, the, the end user, the people uh, who use these materials on a daily basis. So the message that I would really like to bring across really just to reinforce what's already been said that in terms of the net zero agenda yeah we can look to chemistry to provide the creative solutions but these have got to be collaborative solutions I and mean, we can't innovate in isolation thank you john um, so we are going to weave our way through some of all of that um and uh, and what Scotland's chemistry sector has to offer through throughout the event. Um, we're also, as Bill mentioned at the top, going to be playing some films and videos to help fuel the discussion. If you're watching the event live, then we very much welcome your comments and questions. If you're watching on you, YouTube, use the YouTube live chat function. Don't use the comments section, but the live chat fun function. And if you're on Zoom, just use the chat function there as well. We're aiming to run for about an hour and a half. Um, we're already... Um, a bit, a bit past where we hope to be. So we may go a bit beyond that because we've got some fantastic panellists with an awful lot to say. So we'll see where we end up. Apologies if you have to disappear, bang on half past two, but we will see where we get to. Okay, let's kick things off. Um, I think by thinking about the role of innovation in all of this. And Ian, I'm going to bring you in first of all. Ian, if we're going to crack this, to what extent is this about the need to innovate, to do things completely differently, to, to really rethink the way we live, work, everything. 
I suppose there's, there are two answers to that. I think absolutely innovation is fundamentally important. And I think innovation has already led the way in, for example, the shift towards a wide uptake of electric vehicles or the development of bio-based alternative materials, the kind of thing John was talking about, uh, the shift towards a hydrogen economy. All those things are dependent on often quite small companies who have innovated, who have developed new products, who are really helping to point the way. But I guess the other side of an answer would be that innovation is not only about product development. And I think if we are genuinely to innovate, then we need to be thinking about innovation in service delivery, innovation in public services, innovation in the way we think our transport networks, the way our cities work, all of that requires an innovative approach, which requires a different way of thinking about things. And I think that's partly why um, institutes of, of further and higher education are, are fundamental to this process of change. Well, I mean, Caroline, let me bring you in. How well placed do you think Scotland is to be innovative when it comes to uh, achieving net zero? Um, you're seeing a lot happening in Grangemouth. What, where's your take on this? Yeah, I think the, the first thing is that the a lot of the businesses actually are now starting to think, is this a commercial reality? Which is always a very good starting point. Um, if it's not a commercial reality, then the innovation from the universities, that type of thing, can only go such a, and to such an extent. If you don't have businesses wanting to take it up and make these products and develop processes, then they'll nov- never get into the market. But there's also the, sort of the demand side of things from the public, um, and the, the public will drive what the what. So there's sort of like a carrot and stick side of things here. So what we are starting to see in the Grangemouth area is we find, find seeing individual businesses looking at circular processes, circular economy. How can they reduce their, their energy? How can they change their materials? All these types of things are starting to happen. And then you've got the small business type of thing that Ian's referred to, where people are developing new products, new ideas. And where Grangemouth, being our manufacturing sect area for Scotland, we're going to have to look at the small business coming up and the big business coming down. And equally within that, you've got to bring the community with you. Um, And that's a community in the local geography, but the community in in Scotland as as a wider sense. So I think there is an ambition there. I think there's an opportunity there. We just need to make sure that we've got we've got the glue to help actually um, transition. Um, And we're starting, I think, with the easier pieces, easier if there is such a thing. Um, people talking about energy um, and yes we can transition the energy to offshore renewables or to um, to wind and wave you know these technologies but the bigger bigger challenge is the use of carbon because we're still going to need carbon to make things um, and if we still want to do shampoo, if we still want to clean ourselves, if we still want to um, have a car, if we want to get on a hydrogen bus, what's the material that these things are going to be made of? And that's 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 what we're trying to do. Some of the things in the Falkirk Range Mouth area are looking at some of these challenges and how do we how do we move them along um, to make them commercially viable? Yeah. Uh, Jennifer, let me bring you, you back in. I wonder how much this is about... Um, attitude, the extent to which innovation breeds innovation, um, if we're a culture of innovation, um, does that then translate into people embracing change? Do you think that innovation sort of feeds through from the big companies right down to individuals? Um, I think I, I, I suppose I want to follow on from what Caroline said. Is I, I think we have got a fantastic innovation set up across the universities are in such close proximity actually to Grangemouth and the collaboration that goes on. I'm not so worried about innovation per se, it's about the adoption and the scalability. So I think Caroline hit that on the head. And you know, there isn't a shortage of good ideas here. It's about the pool from society and actually the affordability of change. So at the moment, there's there's an aspect of climate change that I think could be almost classed as a bit of a middle-class sport. 
right? <laughs> from, from my perspective of, you know, if we nicely recycle wee bits here and we're doing a wee bit and don't we all feel just a little bit better? But in actual fact, I think that there's going to be such a significant change and it's and some people will be able to afford that change. But when we look at net zero through the lens of just transition, for me, that means people being able to prosper in the future and not leaving people behind. And, and what is the, the cost to that? And how can we make this affordable for everybody so then it's not just a nice little middle class sport? Yeah. Controversial, sorry. Well, no, and, and just transition is a, a hugely important part of this. Um, it's something that I think we'll come back to a, a little bit later because I very much want to hear from everybody on, on how we make that actually possible again in, in reality because there can be ideas and then there's the challenge of, of making actual happen um and that yeah that possibility happen and just transition is very much part of this so let's let's dive into that um a bit more um and i sort of want everyone almost to, to turn off their mute buttons here so that you can be jumping in and and thinking about this commenting on this it's very much this should be a discussion um mark i wanted to to maybe bring you on in on just transition and maybe explain for anyone who, who's, who's less familiar with the phrase what exactly we mean by it and what some of the the, the challenges are with just transition um i mean i guess fundamentally it, it's if we reflect back to the 80s and 90s and the kind of closure of the coal pits and what it meant for entire communities you know to have a whole set of generations without work and no further investment in those areas to enable new industries to emerge and new opportunities. You know, that's the sort of thing we do not want to get to. You know, we have a very significant change that we need to bring about in the coming number of years. So the just transition is about, you know, how we, we can't just have some people um, benefiting from this. You know, we need to make sure that communities continue to grow and thrive and are improved everybody's health environment opportunities are improved um you know so where we have enormous clusters of activity whether that's grangemouth or enormous sectors that employ very large numbers of people like oil and gas sectors and so on we cannot just leave them you know say we no longer wish for you to exist we are moving to something beautiful, green and clean. Um, you're no longer needed. So we really need to think very hard. I mean, those people have had decades of skills, many of them that have contributed to the economic growth of Scotland and are still very valuable. They just need the reskilling and the upskilling into new technologies. Many can transition into green energy. Many will come into the industries that we work with, which are looking at you know, processing and manufacturing of new and bio-based materials. They can easily be transitioned. And, you know, people like Jen and ourselves, we've got lots of workforce activity, skills development, Scotland and others trying to support that. Um, you know, it's a large ship that needs a lot of turning and it's going to take all of us putting our shoulder to it. For me, I think I give evidence to the Just Transition Inquiry and it struck me just the enormity of the task. You know, you feel a very, very small part of any of this because we're so used to working within our circles where we are having impact and we are comfortable. But when you look at the layers and levels of impact that will need to be brought to bear for a just transition in Scotland, the task is enormous. You know, the appetite and enthusiasm is there and it's very positive. But I think the critical bit is, we're at the very, well, we're at the reasonably high level philosophical almost discussions. And we need to get down, as Jen says, into the what is the, you know, what are the near term steps? How can we start making these changes? And then we would hope that, you know, momentum will carry us through and we'll accelerate to a point where we're all delighted about the impact. So, so for me, you know, it's the people that have to send their children to school so that they can get one hot meal a day. You know, these these are the sorts of people. It's not necessarily, as as we said, you know, the sort of middle and upper class people that, that feel they've done themselves proud by going out and buying a very expensive electric car. Um, you know, we really need to get down into how the whole community and the whole population can be part of this transition. So yeah. hopefully that's, that's sort of my opinion, Penny. 
we're going to come back to this again and again throughout uh, the course of this event. Um, we are going to try and look at that first short film. It's a, a great example of where Scotland is at the heart of pioneering research. Next Jenna is the UK flagship project for the Faraday Institution in sodium ion batteries. Batteries are really important in helping net, net zero. There's lots of renewable energy, but you're not always able to use it when it's produced. So the, the key thing is to store that energy in a, in a clean way. And we're at the forefront of developing the sodium ion technology. So no one a uh, scientist or research centre has the capability to really address um, all of the issues uh, that emerge when you're developing a, a technology like sodium ion batteries. So by collaborating it with experts elsewhere, we're able to address that breadth. Like most science, uh, you can do things much better by working in collaboration. It's very much about UK PLC and developing a lot of researchers and capability and knowledge in the battery industry. So we have five university partners, so St Andrews of the Leet. Um, we also have Cambridge, Sheffield, University College London um, and the Science and Technologies Facilities Council. Um, our industrial partners are Faradayan, who are um, probably the world's leader in developing uh, sodium ion batteries. Uh, we work also with Am to Power, who are an important manufacturer of um, lithium and other batteries. And we also have um, a materials partner called Deragala, and they make important uh, materials for the anodes and sodium ion batteries. NextGen is funded by the Faraday Institute to build the UK battery industry, and it's a very significant funded activity with very long-term visions. So batteries have often been the limiting factor um, in technologies in the past. I think you're starting to see a point now where the UK and the world in general is pouring so much resource into battery research that now there seems to be a new development every week. Our vision is to discover new, new chemistries, new materials. One of the things that we're trying to do in NextGen in St Andrews is to scale up. So actually make industrially relevant um, pouch cells. And we've been lucky enough to, be, to get funded through ERDF and Scottish Enterprise to build a battery fabrication facility. One of the features of NextGena is something we call our advanced characterization platform to make measurements actually in situ or in operando. Uh, and there's a number of those approaches and those are, those are really essential and really new. The project is not just about developing the technology, it's about developing capability and skills. The UK really needs to have its own battery industry. And so the project is about building up critical mass across the UK so we as a university train researchers, so we're training future leaders that are going to develop not only this technology but further future evolutions of battery technology in the future. Um, we're also, as part of NextGena, setting up a, a battery um, prototyping facility. And through that and through relationships with our partners, we hope to train people more at a technical level, so how to manufacture batteries um, in future factories in Scotland or, or elsewhere. Perhaps more broadly, if you think about energy justice, and a lot of the chemistry is, is very much to enable the developing world to have a cleaner and healthier society. Really, the fundamental thing about sodium ion batteries is that they, they should be cheap and they should remain cheap eh, as we make more and more of them. And I think it's a really exciting time because I think that's going to snowball. Next Gen it brings together a lot of capability. It, it really brings together a very strong, strong skill set. It, it creates uh, a new partnership which will enable a new battery industry in, in, in the UK. Um, lots of strong messages in there about the importance of collaboration, partnership with industry, recognition of global need for this kind of technology. We're going to pick up on lots of this over the, the, the course of the next week. Well, um, 
Ian, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be possibly asking a very numpty question here, but I'm hoping you'll be able to, to answer it maybe. Um, how does developing new battery technology, these sodium ion batteries, contribute to, to, to net zero? What's the link and maybe the potential impact? Um, and if that's not one for you, then someone else can raise their hand. But I'm just interested to, to know more directly. Well, I'll start off by referring to a couple of other speakers who've already mentioned the, the shift towards electric vehicles. And um, moving towards electric vehicles is a kind of quick win for policymakers in many ways, because you can immediately start to decarbonize transport so long as you, you're comfortable with the concept of, of personal transportation. And of course, the more you move towards electric vehicles, the, the, the demand for, for battery production massively increases. So we're now at the point where the requirements for battery production are getting really quite large compared to their availability. But also, as we move towards more renewable electricity in our system, and particularly through things like offshore wind, you have the issue about intermittency in supply. So you can't always get the electricity when you need it. So the requirements for static power, for static battery systems, or some other alternative means of storing the energy become extremely important. So it supports a number of major transitions. And it's just like one of those component things that suddenly enables a lot of larger shifts to happen. Oh. <laughs> I get that pinned down. Um, I mentioned at the top of the event, there's a, I think there can be a danger of, of pigeonholing chemistry as being all a bit um, uh, Bunsen burners and um, periodic tables and, and, to prove me right, John had one behind him. Um, but I wondered if we could do a bit of a, a dive um, into your field, Mark, and the, the biotech side of things, just as much as anything to, else to demonstrate how multidisciplinary um, chemistry is and, and where it feeds into lots of different areas. Um, you gave us a bit of a flavour at the top, but I wondered if you can give more of a sense of, of what's happening in terms of the biotech sector in, in Scotland and, and more of a sense of the, the sheer range of applications that there are. Yeah, sure, Penny. I'd be delighted to give a little snapshot of what we're engaged with. I mean, the critical bit, you know, we, we need to reflect back on the fact that this session is around chemistry and the impact that it has I would broaden that to be, you know, chemistry and chemical and process engineering, because until we get to scale, we don't have the impact. I also loved hearing in that video um, the fact about the UK building a battery industry. So um, too often we've seen fantastic research and, and development and innovation go overseas and offshore. Um, and I think on the back of the COVID pandemic and the breakdown of particular supply chains, what we've seen is a renewed appetite to use indigenous sources of materials, of feedstocks, of manufacturing, um, and also to look at what is available to us that we can have security of supply without things being shipped all around the world several times over. Um, what's happening in our space? Well, we're, we started out, I guess, as, as sort of the green part of the chemistry sector or the chemical sector. Um, since then, we've grown. So we work across agriculture. So we're working with companies that take waste coffee grounds and treat them chemically. Um, who then turn them into sort of organic uh, fertilizer, specialist fertilizer. We're working with companies in the energy sector who are taking waste fat that I'm sure we've all heard about from horrible places, um, from sewers and from um, chippies and such like, and turning it into biodiesel. Um, we've, we're looking at a project at the minute of, uh, at scale about the reintroduction of sugar beets into Scotland so that we have a, a feedstock that can be converted into sugar. And then from sugar, we can make a whole range of biopolymers, medicines, bioethanol and such like. Um, and also even things like um, fast growing hemp. We've got companies in Scotland growing hemp. Now, some of that can be used for cannabinoid, you know, medicine extraction. But equally, some of it's being turned into smart materials, which are used in construction um, for insulation. And right the way through to things that you thought you'd never hear, which are companies taking shellfish waste and turning it into food packaging uh, biopolymers. Um, so there are there is all colours of the rainbow of carbon flow in Scotland, whether you talk about blue, marine, red, you know, health 
Um, you've got green environmental and such like the one we want to stay away from is black. So black carbon, you know, is often referred to. That's the fossil based carbon. So uh, the critical bit here, I think, is that unless we proactively go looking for alternative sources, they will not fall in our laps. But they will be driven by the large end users because their supply chains will adapt and they will innovate because they will wish to do business and continue to wish doing business. And I think if anyone was looking at a significant statement around that, uh, Unilever's recent statement around its removal of fossil-based carbon in all of its cleaning and detergent business, which is one of its largest businesses globally, um, they will do this by 2030. And so all of a sudden you find ripples running through supply chains as people realize they need to find alternative ways to, to drive the opportunity to make materials to do business. Um, and as consumers, we do not want to reach onto the shelves and find that things are not there for us. You know, it goes against everything in the Western world. You know, we want things, we get things. But I think now we need to be more sensible about we need to proactively grow the opportunities um, and so there are some great companies in Scotland. Actually, last year, one of the reports showed that um, Scotland outperformed the rest of uh, most of Europe, actually, in terms of the number of companies set up around environmental and, and, and agricultural biotechnology and chemistries. So, and for us, we don't differentiate particularly between biotechnology and chemistry. They are intertwined. And so combined processing and um, particular aspects of either um, it's the means to an end, and we just fit them all together like a jigsaw until we get the process that we need. So exciting times. I hope to give you a few examples further as we go through the conversation. Well, I think you've set up our next film beautifully, actually, um, because it's a brilliant example of where biotech research um, happening in Scotland <clears throat> could have a, a serious impact on net zero. So let's take a look at that and then we'll come back. One of the biggest challenges facing us as a society today is to diminish our reliance on non-renewable fossil fuels. I come from a background in chemical synthesis and as opposed to drilling oil out of the ground and transforming this into medicines such as paracetamol, ibuprofen, what we're doing in this research is encoding these molecules into a living organism and having this organism produce these compounds from renewable feedstocks such as carbohydrates, such as carbon dioxide or waste materials. So the environmental impacts of this research can be quite dramatic. Um, to take one example, we're currently working on replacing a petrochemical process with a bio-based alternative. If we're successful in doing this, it will have the same environmental effects as replacing every car in the UK with an electric car. So this work is supported through a UK Government Future Leaders Fellowship, which is offered through UKRI. Um, it's a seven-year programme that's designed to tackle really long-term, ambitious research programmes. As a result of this, um, we have been able to grow our team quite quickly and we've moved into some uh, newly refurbished lab space at the University of Edinburgh. I was intrigued by that. Um, Stephen Wallace, who we heard from there, said if they can replace by uh, petrochemical processes with new bio-based alternatives, the impact could be the equivalent of replacing every car in the UK with an electric car. That's huge and a really impactful statement. Um, I don't understand the chemistry, but I do understand that impact. John, I wonder if I can bring you in here because I wonder if we should be doing more, could be doing more to translate the impact of what is happening in terms of research to the real world so that people who are non-chemists get it and get on board with it. Do we need to communicate better? What could we be doing? I think we definitely need to communicate better. I, I mean, I was thinking through what I've been hearing. There's a lot of eyes uh, around, I words around um, net zero. You know, we've spoken about um, innovation. We've spoken about interdependence. We need to invest, we need to integrate, um, but we need to inform and we need to influence. Uh, and I think it's very, very important that we as chemists don't sit in our ivory tower. We're out there engaging public and policymakers in, in order to get this message across that chemistry is contributing at this sort of scale. Um, you do get sort of negativity and people will come back and say, well, there's 300 million tonnes of polymers being produced uh, yearly. Um, 
uh, of which the bio-based alternatives only currently represent about 0.5%. And they'll say, but that's a huge mountain that you've got to climb and you've got to uh, overcome. Uh, and so then you get inertia because people say there's no point in starting, it's too big a challenge. But when you hear of messages like that, that somebody in a lab using bio-based technologies um, to to make trans- transformations and that sort of scale, that's phenomenal. That's a message that needs to get out there. It's not a message even I had actually heard until I saw the video uh, at the end of last week when I was having a look at it. Um, so this information and influence is absolutely critical to getting out there. This is why I think these workshops in particular are very, very helpful. But we need to even go beyond this community and, and look much wider. Um. Probably scale, um, and, and you said there's a lot of I words being talked about. Um, right at the beginning, um, scale was mentioned by several of the panelists as being um, a key challenge. Um, scale within your area is also a key challenge. So we know what the potential impact could be, but that's potential based on if we can get things up to, to scale. What, what's stopping that? What, what's stopping it for you, for example? In many cases, it's simply investment. Um, capital costs are, are large. Uh, when I was working, going back to the days of, of working at ICI and, and the Biopol project, it was multi-million pound investments, tens of millions of pounds investments we're putting in to make 300 to 500 tonnes of our polymer a year. That's an awful lot of money for us, a relatively small output. Uh, I, I, and I think that's one of the challenges that we face uh, is, is getting sufficient market make, encourage um, investors to make the investment needed to implement the technology. Uh, and there, there is this sort of critical gap here, you know, the valley of death in terms of any investment is, yes, you've got innovation. Ultimately, you've got the investment, but how do you actually encourage investors to have sufficient confidence to make that transition? I see, I see that Mark, I think, has got something to say there. Is it Mark or Ian? Mark, you come in. Um, I, I have my hand up. Um, oh, sorry, Ian. That, that, that's okay. I think I think I, I, I agree with John about investment, but I suppose the point I want to make is that the biggest investment will come from large companies who see that their markets are diminishing. And I think in order to support that change, there therefore is incumbent upon public organisations and legislators to force that level of change. We saw it happen in the 90s with um, chlorofluorocarbons in aerosol emittents. We saw the change that happened when the public forced their policymakers to, to remove those expellents from aerosols. And I think a similar change is possible. But at the moment, the system supports a business as usual. And I think if, for example, we move towards a carbon taxation, a carbon based model of taxation, you would see oil and gas companies and petrochemical companies scrabbling to support a process of innovation and change like nothing before. All right. Well, um Let's see what Caroline has to, to say about that. What do you think um, Grangemouth would think to uh, carbon taxation? Um, or, you know, what, what's the answer? What, what's inhibiting um, yeah. progress in, in Grangemouth? There, there's probably a couple of things there. Um, the, and it might be that carbon taxation comes. Um, who, who knows? Uh, that, that might well be something that, that comes. Um, but I think there's a there's certainly a, a couple of angles on on this. Um, go, if we talk about the sort of the, the the demonstration and do people want to make um, transition their products? If there's a commercially viable um, business model, then then I think business would. Over, with perhaps to begin with, maybe need some support, some incentives. But I think they would certainly look to do that. I think most of the, the businesses that we see in Grangemouth now are thinking about what they're calling sustainability plans, circular circular plans, circular manufacturing plans, much more from what we used to see was a linear manufacturing where you take the gas, you make a product, it go, falls off the end and goes into landfill. It's now all about circularity. And then how can you in can you insert instead of say for example taking ethane gas how could you have uh, say by beat, beat um, that type of thing for for your starter material hy- hydrogen um, the the other thing when we're talking about these type types of things is um, 
a lot of businesses um, do their own innovation, but a lot of businesses don't do their own innovation. So a lot of businesses buy innovation when they see a product or a process that they could potentially take into their business rather than having the invest in the innovation, which is where um, obviously where the, the commercialization and the spin outs from the academics um, comes into play. But the, the, what we're trying to um, target in the Grangemouth area is the piece between the academic spinning out of the academic lab and perhaps doing a bit of scale up to the scaling up in a full manufacturing sense. So looking around about uh, sort of a test and demonstration facility for industrial biotech, um, working very strongly with the, the iBio IC um, and other businesses on that front so that people can actually come in and say, I've got a product I think could make a difference to you, whether it's Unilever, whether it's Ineos, whether it's you name it, one of the one of a business. It might not be a a, um, a massive chemical company. It could be a secondary or a tertiary tier of chemical companies. But if if they cannot demonstrate the capability and the the difference that their product or process will make, people won't invest in it. They won't buy it. So that needs to be able to be done. And the same the same idea around about carbon dioxide utilization. We have huge amounts of carbon dioxide in the environment. If we want to stop taking more out the ground as we transition, then we need to think about how do we use what's already in the process. And we can actually say, well, a, car a company could capture its carbon. They could put it up a pipeline or they could put it on a boat and it could go up to the Acorn GoldenEye facility and it could store. But you think, yes, it's going to be needed because we're going to create, still create more carbon than we can use. But actually, wouldn't it be better if we could use the carbon that's already in the system? And that's the other test and demonstration type of facility that we're, we're looking to, to do in, in that space. Um, there was another point, but it's going right out my head. So I'll let somebody else come in and maybe come back. Well, I think what we'll do, actually, we'll look at our next short film because it's a, a, a really nice example of industry and academia coming together, though probably the other way around to, to the way you were suggesting it there. Let's have a, a look at that and then we'll come back. The problem we were trying to, to overcome was to come up with a great phase change material, one that was cost effective, one that would cycle many, many times, uh, one that you know just basically did what you'd expect a phase change material to do. Melt and freeze cleanly, absorb a lot of energy when it melts, release the energy when it freezes, and turned out the market wasn't really offering that in the way that we wanted. So we went looking for a solution. A colleague of mine uh, contacted a number of people and one of them he contacted was Interface uh, and he had a really interesting and good experience of dealing with Interface it was a very clear question about what the problem statement was which he provided and then Interface came back a while later and said we've tried everywhere and we, 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 we can't find somebody who deals with phase change materials but would somebody who deals with nucleation or crystallization be a good person? And we both looked at each other and we said, yeah, that sounds exactly like the sort of person that we want. And it was from there that we got introduced to, to Colin, and, uh, or Professor Pullum, to give him his proper title. And, uh, and the rest is, is very good history. I think there are numerous benefits. You know, not least is the, you know, the the collaborative research and indeed funding. We also, I think, experienced the excitement, if you like, of, of working you know, close to a startup company with all the all of the challenges which were associated with it, and that gives gave me as an academic an understanding of how business works. And Andrew was always saying to me, "What about cost? What about cost?" And as academics, you know, we don't necessarily have to think about about cost. And actually, it's given me a new research area, which I think is I would not be in this area without Andrew's uh, involvement, and that's really very 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 important. And then the the, the, the final 
aspect is the demonstration of socio-economic impact, which you know, the UK government is very interested in, uh, Scottish government is very interested in. And this is all about you know, demonstrating how research in laboratories, in academic you know, uh, institutions, can improve, uh, make socio-economic impact. And this is a, an excellent example of, of a, a really good story of, of how fundamental research has been applied, translated, and is actually changing the quality of people's lives and having an, e an economic impact. Mm -hmm. This is important because in the next uh, Research Excellence Framework uh, exercise in 2021, you know, there will be impact case studies, and I am determined that there will be a SUNAMP University of Edinburgh impact case study highlighting the, the successful partnership. Another fantastic story there. Um, I wonder if I can bring you back in. Is there an, enough of that um, either way relationship between, I mean, in that case, industry going to academia and saying, here's a problem we need to solve. Um, uh, I wondered whether you think we could be doing better in greasing the wheels in both directions with the relationship between industry and, and the research side of things. Uh, you're on mute at the moment, Jennifer. Well, I need to press the button harder. Um, <laughs> I think we've got a, a really good relationship established. I think we could always do more. And I think actually going back to a point earlier in that Scotland is, is small, but actually it's a, it's a community of its own. And I, I think we could reach out across that more and and do work in less in silos a bit and more collaboratively together. And I think we're beginning to do that. And so, for example, um, in the, the campus that I work in, in Falkirk and Forth Valley College, we're um, going to be bringing in, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, Scott Chem to be able to actually have a base there. And also IBIYC are hopefully going to base a small aspect of their operations out there. And that interconnectivity, I think, is crucial. And I think we need to do much, much more of that. Because somebody mentioned earlier about the valley of death, and I think that's the one area where, where we struggle, is, is not through lack of innovation, but it's actually getting it out and into practical application. And, and I think going back to something that Caroline said earlier, you know, yes, there, apps, there needs to be a commercial footing for this, and it needs to be able to sit on that. But the other thing that I, I would like the panel to think about is how do we change our behaviours as society? And so how are we going to do that? And if you think about the ban on smoking that came in, you know, when that was first muted, people thought we would never, ever achieve a ban on, on smoking. And can you imagine now going into a restaurant and lighting up a cigarette? Who's going to tell you to put that out? It probably won't be the restaurateur. It'll probably be the person on the table next to you. So how did we achieve that and how do we achieve behavioural change? You know, we all, the majority of us wear seatbelts, but, you know, if I think back to my granny, she was appalled at the thought of wearing a seatbelt. So we can do that, but we need to combine the science and the innovation with the practical aspects and then also the behavioural aspects of how are we going to change what we do? I think it's more, it's not linear. There's a multifaceted part to this and each part has, has something to play. And I think that... For me, a big part of this is it's a whole stick and carrot thing. Um, what do you use in order to, to, as you say, get change? But it's the fact that this reaches really deep into lots of personal areas of our lives. I mean, smoking was a great example because that was a personal area of our lives and it did affect, you know, there was a massive change that came about. Um, but but the whole net zero, um, the challenges of it reaches into it really lots and lots of, of different behaviours and how you get all of us, um, I, I'm always wary of this sort of get them people to change. Actually, it's all of us. Um, uh, how we change lots and lots of different aspects of the way we live, we work, um, is uh, move, travel, everything is a, is a really big, um, big part of this. Um, I want to move on to, to um, the kind of global issues of this. I mean, we've been talking very much about Scotland. Um, but the problems that we're looking at uh, and the problem of achieving that zero, it's a global one. Um, and we're 
chipping away at the problem here in Scotland. There's some fantastic innovative research, um, but the problem's not confined to any one area of the world. So I'm quite interested to, to explore some of that relationship between innovation and research happening here and, and it's translating into what's happening around the, the globe. Ian, let me bring you back in. I mean, how, how important do you think uh, international collaboration is if we're, we're striving for net zero? Because the problem's international, it's global. It is. And I think academia has always performed extremely well in terms of international connections. You know, I think any academics uh, listening to this call probably have their own international connections. Collaborative research across frontiers has happened for years, uh, or papers authored by uh, researchers from different countries. I think that's the norm in academia. And that, that starts a good, sets a good standard for how we can operate here. We're um, currently involved in a project with an Indian university university looking at the way in which we can help to translate some of our technological developments into potential deployment in that particular region in India where the transition to electric vehicles particularly for small vehicles you know auto rickshaws mopeds and so on is massive that pace of change is enormous and I think the UK can contribute a lot to that so I think it's it's partly about joint research research it's partly about transfer of knowledge and that's a two-way transfer of knowledge and experience um, and I think there's also a really important climate justice point, which you hinted at at the beginning here, which is that we can no longer have a situation where the developing world is producing materials so that the developed world can simply produce more carbon. That, that's an unsustainable way of operating, and we need to be thinking of, of alternative economic models. Um, John, let me bring you back in here. Um, how How... Well placed do, does, is, is your university and do you see Scotland in general in terms of global collaboration and, and partnership? Is it something that you're very much involved with? Do you think there's potential for more of it? There's always potential for more. I think we're very well placed. I don't want to just fly a flag for staff Clyde, but we recruit about 30 or so young academics a year as part of a, 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 a yearly annual sort of recruitment process that encourages people from overseas to, to work at Strathclyde. And we, we speak to these people and we say, why do you want to come to Scotland? Uh, more generally, not just Strathclyde. And they see Strathclyde as intellectually leading. They like, uh, and Jennifer touched upon this, the scale of Scotland. It's interconnected. The policymakers are there. We can let, you can influence policymakers. Um, they see Scotland as it's, it's not geographically isolated. If in Scotland, we might think that oh, we're a long way away from London and we're even further from the continent. Um, the, the, the Chancellor's Fellows, as we call them, when they, they come to, to Scotland, they simply see Amsterdam as being a, an hour's hop away. Um, they, they see, uh, you know, they, they will probably spend longer in that from the States just flying to their nearest university. Um, and they've got this sort of global connectivity that Scotland has. I think we need to build still further our global connectivity. Um, literally, uh, there's this tension here between carbon footprints and, and global connectivity. But I think what we can take advantage of is the unfortunate circumstances that have led us to it, it, it is the electronic uh, connectivity that we have as a result of COVID. The fact that we can gather this sort of um, audience, and this is a Scottish paid audience, but we could do this on a global basis. So I, I think Scotland is attractive, and I think this is really important for us that we don't just um, take our existing community and try and engage externally, but we bring some of that external community to Scotland and get those people to help shape what we're doing. So not too much uh, contemplating of the naval, but engaging globally and getting the best ideas and the best scientists coming to Scotland. I mean, and uh, you were sort of referring it to it there, but in a sense that they can all be coming to Scotland now via Zoom, where we've spent so much of our lives in the past um, 18 months. I mean, I wonder whether it has genuinely shifted how um, we are working, um, and both in, in industry, but also the academic side of things. I mean, Mark, have you seen a shift in things because of the way we're more prepared to sit on a platform like this and share ideas and, and communicate? Is it is it changing things? Yeah, I think um, certainly productivity has been very high, you know, in terms of once people got to grips with 
electronic platforms and you know whatever it was fine there was a period of course where you know sort of lab based work was ceased you know was stopped you know and now it's all come back in again and ramping up but we certainly saw that with our scale up centers you know it's now us trying to get those collaborative projects that we've got between academia and business trying to get them through the lab you know that have been stacked up basically so we're under quite a bit of pressure at the minute with a whole pipeline of projects that we've agreed to deliver um you know within lab space but outside of that you know we are a, a network and an innovation center that drives the growth and collaboration and translation of academia into commercialization and actually we've outperformed most of our metrics in the quarters that you know we said we would do um the thing that's unsustainable is people's behavior on electronic platforms in that we cannot sit from 9 till 5 every day constantly back to back talking without a bio break or a cup of coffee you know which so that's a learning that we've all had we've had to say i'm sorry you know i'm not doing that meeting i will start in 15 minutes or we do so many meetings i'm not running more than 2 hours and so on but i think in terms of how we've continued to meet new companies support company growth support academic interaction that that's all worked really well you know and i wouldn't like us to continue in this mode for a lot longer because i'm missing the the social and business interaction as probably all of you are but um you know we have we could have come out of this finding half of our small companies have imploded and actually it's a very small number of the companies you know um that have had some challenges as we've gone along so you know we've got 120 members most of which are SME and micro companies the rest are sort of multinationals um and they're all back back in business again you know so i think that's a very positive thing and shows i think the resilience of science based activity you know science chemistry based activity that we can keep going and now we're into sort of accelerating getting things back up to where they were before I think this is a good place to bring in um, our next short film and give you a break from the screen. Um, and this one highlights uh, a global collaboration between Scotland and Pakistan. This workshop was titled as Sustainable Energy Transition for Pakistan and this is funded by the British Council. And the aim of this workshop was to bring together teams of early career researchers from the UK and Pakistan to share research expertise and to develop collaborations relevant to enabling a sustainable energy transition in Pakistan. So the key challenges related to energy in Pakistan they are multifaceted. for example we have policy issues uh, then we have some social issues and then the other side is from the technical point of view one of the real surprises for me from a uk perspective was that pakistan has really quite a significant energy surplus at the moment certainly in terms of electricity but the, the geographical distribution of access to energy is really very patchy so in the cities you might have really good connection to an electricity grid uh, and then as you move out into rural areas that connection gets more and more patchy and then in some rural areas there's no electricity provision at all and in those off grid population the most of the women they are affected because they are working at home so there are gender issues as well related to different challenges related to energy from a sustainability point of view it's working out how to give energy access to the people in the most remote areas in a sustainable manner that's the real challenge and so basically this workshop was one step in that direction so as you know most of the issues which the world is facing especially from climate change perspective uh, they are very multidisciplinary in nature so there's a very strong need for people to think out of their own domain and to interact with people outside of their region So 
As a result of this workshop, we formed a number of new collaborations between UK and Pakistani researchers. In fact, we formed at least a dozen new collaborative teams, and of those eight are going to receive seed funding to start work on specific projects, including developing new and cleaner cooking stoves for rural cooking, also improving people's health, uh, and also uh, to minimize pollution and deforestation for sustainable energy storage in Pakistan. And importantly, a lot of these will utilize materials and processes that can be rendered indigenous to Pakistan so that Pakistan can produce its own batteries for sustainable energy storage. And also projects looking at new ways to convert agricultural and municipal waste into fuels. And then we hope that after the conclusion of these projects, these collaborations will lead beyond that and people will find more opportunities to collaborate on bigger issues related to energy and climate change. So climate change is a global problem that affects us all. And so addressing the sustainable energy transition in, in Pakistan is of interest to Scotland as well as Pakistan. And this workshop provided an opportunity for Glasgow and Lahore University of Management Sciences to forge a collaboration and really to try and lead the research agenda in this area. And so this really has helped to put Scottish science and Scottish chemistry right at the forefront of a globally pressing issue. That, that film, in a sense, picks up on so many of the different things that we've been talking about in terms of collaboration, um, uh, the, the flow of knowledge, um, uh, the, the global opportunities, but of, of course, um, the just transition, the principles behind that. Um, I, I want to come on to, to look at um, uh, employment as a, an area, but just before I do, is there anything anyone particularly wanted to pick up from that, that film? Um, give me a wave if you did. If not, we'll, we'll move forward. Oh, that was giving me a wave. Okay. Um, now, I'm conscious, uh, forgive me for saying this, but we're all fairly old and crusty. Um, the people who will be inheriting net zero, um, the net zero world and driving innovation into the future will be um, the next generation uh, and the next generations after that, a lot younger than us, that's for sure. Um, Jennifer, I mean, if, if chemistry has a key to solving um, a lot of these huge problems and challenges relating to net zero, how important is it? that we engage new generations of innovators and researchers into the field of chemistry. And how big a challenge is that? And, and where, where are you at with, with work in that area? Um, I, I think it's hugely important. And I think that for me, another aspect of Just Transition is about educating people so they've got the tools and the abilities and the personal behaviours actually to be able to make decisions in the future that are of benefit to them so it's not just about innovation but it's actually about training and educating people so then they can deal with what they're going to face in the future um, and I think that's slightly different um, to, to where we are now. I think that we have spent quite a bit of time um, over the last few years trying to pull various different demographics into into STEM subjects and I think we've actually had quite a bit of success with regards to that so I, I think that there are options and there are programs but I think we need to start thinking much bigger and wider about engagement and education and having it through the entire curriculum so for me you know net zero whilst chemistry I personally think will hold quite a significant um answer for, for where we need to get to it is by no means the only answer and I think we have to start pushing all of that through all of the curriculum that we have um, and making it meaningful for people and what does it mean for everyday people on the street and their lives and I think that's quite difficult and how do you change that generation but I suppose it goes back to my point about smoking which is if we don't start doing stuff today then there's no there's no way that we're going to get um, to where we need to in 2030. So if you're 21 today, 
in 2030 you're going to be beginning your first. That's quite scary. You know, there's, there's nine years to really make an impact or you're starting you're in the middle of primary school and in nine years' time you're going to be coming out and looking either for a job or university. It's a short window of opportunity that we've got. So we need to start moving things at pace. I wonder if that, um, the fact that it's a short window, I mean, brings with it a pressure which is really sitting on those those younger shoulders. When I started at the, the start of this, I said, I think it's quite scary the what we've got to try and achieve. Um, and I wonder whether that's even scarier if you're younger and have, have more of your life ahead of you to try and kind of tackle some of these things. Um, do you see it as being, are we, are we putting... A lot of pressure on young shoulders is that a problem so i i think it can be scary and I, actually we were discussing the, the un report today that came out um at nine o'clock this morning and i think people are fearful but what i would say is i think we need to try and dispel that fear because if we're, if we're stuck with fear we're not going to go anywhere so we actually need to break it down into smaller bits and make it manageable and make it realistic for, for people so what else if you think about what can I do if I do, you know, if I don't do very much, it's not going to have that much impact. But actually, it is about small changes for lots of different people that will then, you know, work its way up to having something that's bigger. And I do think that the young people are, we've been working in, in field change over the last year about engaging and educating individuals that are sort of next generation, generation Z. And actually, I've been overwhelmed by how adaptable people are and how passionate and how energetic people are the one thing that I would say is I think a lot of people think that that younger people are really engaged in climate change I don't think they are at all um, I think that there is an aspect where people understand what it is but engaged and doing things about it on a repetitive basis because that's not for them that's for policymakers, is it not so th there's a question around how do you change that? And I think that's the point that I've been coming back to throughout this discussion is how do you change behaviours sustainably? I'm going to come back to fuel change in just a second because we've got a film about that and I want you to introduce it. Um, Ian, you raised your hand. Yeah. I just want to say I agree with an awful lot of what Jennifer's just said, but I think I'd probably like to be a little bit more optimistic about the way in which young people are responding to the challenge. I think, the, you know, there's a problem in the UK. We've hollowed out the manufacturing sector, the engineering sector over a period of decades. Those, those progression routes through chemistry, through science into some kind of career in this is probably not clear for a lot of young people. But I occasionally do a sort of a, you know, kind of guest lecture slot with some of the first and first years at the university. University of St Andrews and what really impresses me is the quality of the questions and the quality of thought of 18 year olds who admittedly are among the brightest in the country that are a top class university but they really get it they really understand that some process of transition is extremely important here and I think two words I would say that have offered a, a bit of hope to that generation those two words are Greta Thunberg who I think has single-handedly helped a generation to realise that they are part of the solution. They are the solution. And they can have a voice. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, what Greta uh, proved is that you, you can have a voice and actually a, a considerable voice if you, if you put it out there. Um, sure. sure, sure. Um, let's have a look at our, our um, final short film, which is about fuel change. Uh, Jenny, just before we watch it, can you just explain what fuel change actually is so that um, we can set the scene for, for watching the video. Sure. Um, so Fuel Change is uh, an organisation that was created over a year ago to look at, as I said earlier, educating and empowering young people to take action and on innovation, actually. So not just about having um, having practical innovation and, and bringing action to, to some climate change aspects. So we have a foundations programme in schools. We have a challenges network that's running at the moment, um, which is for apprenticeships, for um, graduate and modern apprentices. And um, we've also got a projects division, which is really about pulling those through. So um, it, it started out as an aspiration and it's something that's been working for the last year really successfully. Okay, well, let's have a little watch of the film and pick up on it afterwards. Cheers. Hello, 
My name is Nia Lowe. I'm the Strategic Workforce Renewal Manager for SP Energy Networks. Together with my team, I'm responsible for all the different apprentice and trainee programs in our business. With COP26 on the horizon and our aspirations for a better future quicker, we are absolutely delighted to be part of the Fuel Change Initiative, both as the supporting partner and through our apprentices taking part. I believe this initiative has given all the apprentices involved a fantastic opportunity to gain new skills and confidence through working on something which is just a little different to their normal day job. It's also made them really think about what low carbon means and to stretch their knowledge to come up with new ideas to real problems facing the partner companies. I also hope this opportunity has opened their eyes to the fact that even though they are on an apprenticeship and are still training, they are still able to contribute real value to industry and to our communities as we collectively tackle the environmental challenges we face in our journey to net zero. And as young people, you must walk about thinking, what is this climate change all about? What am I going to do about it? How can I actually contribute to it? Maybe you're frustrated because you can't do something. Well, you can do something, you can do something right now, you can be part of fuel change, you can work with others in a real environment that is all around proper challenges. And the feedback from employers have been almost unanimous across the board. Your teams have done fantastically well and they're really proud of them. So from any angle, this is a great programme to join and I've loved being part of it. It's been an amazing opportunity, not only to work with other people in my company who, you know, we wouldn't usually get to work together, um, networking, um, being able to, you know, speak to other companies, um, but also, you know, just being able to focus on trying to do something really positive um, and look at how we can make a positive impact. We've done our research and it's been a great networking opportunity for all of us, especially because my generation is the one that will have to deal with a lot of the, the side effects of global warming that I, I'm really glad I have taken part in this project so that I can say I have done something to help fix the problems around. Since SP Energy Networks are one of the key distributors of energy within the country, it is important as a young apprentice to know how important it is for a company like this to strive towards these key aspects and make sure they achieve them in the long run. You get to talk to different supervisors and people in the factory, but you'd never get to experience a side of the the work like this, communicating with different companies, other people, so it's great for yourself and you're getting to help change the environment outside, reduce the emissions and get the net zero goal. Obviously it might inspire other people um, to think outside the box and change their attitudes towards how, how we, we use our products. I would recommend getting involved in the Fuel Change project because it's a chance for you to actually make a difference. You'll find that you have to push yourself out of your comfort zone to get the information you need from other companies because sometimes just looking at a website is not enough. Um, I would say definitely if you have the opportunity to go ahead as part of your apprenticeship because if, you, if your project ultimately ends up going ahead, your name's attached to that. I would definitely say that it's, it's something that anyone um, you know, should do, especially if you know, you're an apprentice and you're at the beginning of your career and you want to develop yourself further. Jenny, can I just ask out of interest, what, what kind of proper challenges um, were they tackling on the, the fuel change? Can you give us some, some examples of some of the kind of questions that, that were put to them or the, the kind of things they were trying to solve? Yeah, sure. So there's, um, there's two challenges that are live at the moment. Um, and the question sort of involved with each. So one of the challenges that's live at the moment is around green mice itself. So looking at sustainable manufacturing, looking at plastics and, and are they actually good or bad? Um, how do we look at energy in the future for Grange Mice and, and what does that look like? Um, and there's also been some questions set by innovation centres. So looking at how do you um, deal with waste from distilleries and the circular economy of, of heat and how does that help in more rural uh, locations? 
And actually, Data Lab have set a, a question with regards to looking at fuel poverty itself and looking at areas of multiple deprivation and trying to see if they are linked and what are the opportunities to be able to tackle some of that in a proactive and um, utilising renewable solutions. So there's, they're quite wide ranging, the ones that are live at the moment. Um, the previous ones were, were equally as interesting and diverse, but they were set by businesses. And that's really, I suppose, the point with regards to this. It was real business problems looking for real business solutions. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, I want to answer a couple of the questions um, we've we've had in, actually. Um, let me have a quick look through here. Um, how much does policy have a role in changing minds? We've been talking quite a bit about the, the need to shift, um, shift attitudes, thoughts. We had the, the smoking example earlier on. Um, so how much does policy have a role in changing minds? Who should I throw that one to? I'm going to throw that to Mark. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, I think, uh, I mean, policy is critical, but, you know, we all have a role to make sure that the policymakers have the right set of information that's put before them to help them make those decisions, you know, in a, in a, in a range of different environments. You know, we've, we've all seen things that we've, I guess, have been driven by policy, you know, Jen's examples are absolutely true. We look back on them now and, and say, why did we ever worry, you know, that this was never going to come to bear? But the near-term rollout of those policies was pretty painful and quite aggressive in some particular sectors, if you think about it, you know, hospitality sector, pubs and clubs and so on, you know, with the no smoking aspects and whatever. Um, we survived them, of course we do, and move on. But um, I think for us, our role is we, you know, we don't lobby directly. We're not a trade association. You know, they have their jobs to do. But for us, it's about giving them, you know, um, relevant information and our expertise to help them make those decisions. So we work very closely with Scottish government and and UK government as well on on helping them to do that. We see ourselves very much as one of the main leaders in in the sort of bioeconomy space and across the whole of the UK um, and and Europe in many ways. So I think that's that's the point. We all have a responsibility to make sure that the policymakers are engaged and are informed, and then it's for them to set the policy um, that then you know falls into place after that. Thanks, Mark. We are up against time. We are out of time, which seems extraordinary. That has absolutely flown by. I'm going to do something really, uh, really, really difficult. I hope I'm going to be allowed to just have a, a closing remark from, from each of you. Um, what would you say to a young person, a member of the public or business about what chemistry can do for them for net zero? And you can't, you can, I'm only letting you have a little bite, each of you at this. Um, Mark, I'll let you go and have a little think about it because I dropped you, <laughs> I dropped you in at the deep end a second ago. Ian, I'm going to show that one to you, first of all. What would you, you say to a young person, member of the public or a business about what chemistry can do for them for net zero in a nutshell? Um, if, as, assuming that they're not going to go into a chemistry career, I would say think about all of those uh, products and services that you are going to be using that are going to help to reduce your carbon footprint. Somehow chemistry has got a part of every one of those. Thank you. Caroline? I suppose in a same, similar vein, it's all pervading. Um, without chemistry, we're not going to be living. Wow. Uh, Jennifer? <laughs> for me it's the building blocks and if you understand the building blocks and you can rearrange them in various different ways then you can solve the problems that you need to solve and still have the things that you want to have in the future John 74% of Scotland's carbon footprint is associated with the production and consumption of materials as chemists we can help reduce the associated footprint of the materials that we use every day. And finally to you, Mark. Yeah, I think um, very simply, you know, chemistry is the, the glue that joins all of this together. It has so many touch points across so many technologies um, and sectors that it's, it's essential that Scotland's chemistry 
prowess um, is, is significant and it's brought to bear on the net zero challenge. Thank you. Well, I set out at the start of this saying that I hoped we'd all come away informed, energised and empowered to feel that change was not only possible, that, but that each of us could play a part in it. Um, I have learned so much um, and feel massively inspired by talking to you all and hearing a bit. I mean, we could have gone on talking for a long, long time, but hearing just a bit about what Scotland's chemistry sector has to offer in the race to net zero. Um, I hope our audience has enjoyed this as much as we all have. A big thank you to Energy Transport Partnership, Research and Innovation Scotland and to Scott Chem for bringing the series and this particular event together. Um, and of course, a massive thank you to our panel, Jennifer Tempany, Caroline Strain, Dr. Mark Bustard, Ian Hill and Professor John Liggett. There are five more events in the 2021 Energy Innovation Emporium. So do visit the ETP Scotland website for further information and to register for those. Also, do look out for further information on the forthcoming Research Innovation Scotland COP26 conference to be held on the 26th of October. For now, though, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Cheers.